Good day everyone, it's Allo, and today I'm going to be checking out Prehistoric Planet Episode 4, Ice Worlds. I'll be checking the things I got correct and incorrect, while ignoring the other aspects of the show. If you want to see a broader review, or the reviews for the previous episodes, click the link in the description, or click the card in the top right. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe for more of this kind of content. So, without any further ado, let's dig into it. The episode begins with a segment of an unnamed dromaeosaurid, but it's most likely dromaeosaurus, due to the time and place of the segment. It has nice, almost iridescent feathers, and countershading, which could aid camouflage in a dark, snowy environment. It checks an old spot for food that it stored, which is nice. Dromaeosaurs were some of the most intelligent dinosaurs, and while not quite as smart as Jurassic Park depicts them, they would have been quite intelligent for reptile standards with one study saying they would have been smarter than a rabbit, and another roughly on par with a chicken. They do exhibit pack hunting, however, which, while it impossible, there's basically no evidence for it in dromaeosaurs, or really any dinosaurs, other than maybe Albertosaurus. Except for some footprints walking in the same direction, but this could also be a group gathering to a carcass, or water in a drought. But it does make sense that they target the baby Edmontosaurus, and not an adult, However, at least some of the adults should have keratinous crests, because the species shown has to be E regardless, due to the time and living in Canada, which has had a mummified fossil found with this comb. But whichever species this is, they should definitely be thicker. Their tails are kind of flimsy, and their arms, and especially the neck, are slightly too skinny. Taking a quick break from the individual segments, there is a weird thing about this episode. The episode is titled Ice Worlds, but A, a decent chunk isn't even shown in snowy parts, like the Olora Titan segment, and B, the whole concept is kind of flawed. I like that they tried to show that dinosaurs didn't only live in tropical forests and plains, because they didn't, but the Cretaceous is not really the time to show this level of snow. During the Cretaceous, temperatures were roughly 10 degrees Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit, warmer than today. It was the warmest period in the last 200 million years, and while some light snow at the poles during the winter is possible, this level of ankle-deep snow is simply unrealistic. The next part shows us the Struthia mimus. I love that it has feathers and resembles its namesake, the ostrich, and I also love the weird mohawk that it has. They have a contest of building nests and out of sticks and such, not unlike some penguins that do the same with stones, and just like those penguins, they steal from each other to make the best nest possible. We next see a herd of Allura Titan. They look great and have their signature long neck, from which it gets its name, which translates to Titanic Swam. It makes these super amplified calls, which is accurate. It was a Lambiosaurine, similar to Parasaurolophus, and well, Lambiosaurus, which had these huge crests. They were hollow and connected to the nostrils, so they most likely acted as resonating chambers for the calls. These are simulated calls of Parasaurolophus, used in the game Prehistoric Kingdom. They would have also been for display, which is shown with some individuals having more brightly coloured crests than the males. When the babies hatch, they are very distinct from the adults, with much bigger heads relative to their body size, and they're missing their distinct crest, only having a bony bump. Modern animal babies also look very different to their adult counterparts, so the same was most likely true for dinosaurs. I also love that they play with each other, it's very cute. The next part is about an unnamed troodontid. Now, of course, any mention of Troodon is reason for me to start ranting about it. It was named in 1856, based off of a single tooth, and it was originally thought to belong to a lizard. One tooth is obviously not enough to validly name a genus, as there is not enough material to distinguish one specimen from another, and almost all Troodontids from the area were named as Troodon. Troodon has thus been named a Nomen dubium, an invalid taxon. All specimens classified as Troodon were mostly reassigned to Latin Divinatrix and Stunonicosaurus. The family Troodon today is still a thing, however, and it is closely related to dromaeosaurs and birds. The animal shown is unnamed, however, which means that I can't know what species it is, because no other named animals are shown. But it looks in line with Troodontids, being fully feathered with huge eyes. Troodontids, and to lesser extent dromaeosaurids, had huge scleral rings, rings of bone in the eye socket in most reptiles and birds, that supported the eye, from which we can determine the size of it. 
and in some cases even in what light conditions they hunted. For example, we know that Velociraptor hunted at dusk or dawn, and as shown, Troodontids likely hunted in mid to low light conditions. It is also shown using fire to herd mammals towards it, which, while it sounds crazy, isn't impossible. Troodontids were some of the most intelligent dinosaurs, with the largest brain-to-body ratio of any non-avian dinosaur. And modern eagles in Australia have been documented herding fire to hunt. So, pyromaniac troodontids are not implausible. We next see a trio of Antarctopelta. While the precise arrangement of osteoderms on this animal is unknown, it did likely have a shield on the hips, similar to Sauropelta, as is shown, and similar to most nodosaurs, huge spikes on the shoulder, which are absent. With the discovery of Stegorus, a close relative to Antarctopelta, we now think that Antarctopelta may have had a blade-like club on its tail, similar to Stegorus. Their tail weapon was similar to Aztec weapons, and almost like a cross between a Thagomizer and a club. A hadrosaur is shown in this segment, but it goes unnamed, as in so far no hadrosaur fossils have been found with Antarctopelta because it's in Antarctica. So this is speculation, however hadrosaurs were some of the most widespread groups of dinosaurs, so it's not impossible. The final segment is about a herd of Pachyrhinosaurus. They look good, and has their iconic nasal boss, a huge mass of bone where the horns would be in most dinosaurs. It also has quills on its tail, which doesn't have any direct evidence, but a basal ceratopsian, Cetacosaurus, does have many mummified fossils which sow tail quills, so it's not impossible. The babies don't have horns atop their frills, but the adults do, which is a nice touch. The Nanuxaurus have a bushy coat, which is likely, they have small keratinous crests and nice patterns, and overall just look great. I'm happy that we get to see these unique dinosaurs in this documentary, and alongside the Dinosaurus series, Nanuxaurus is getting plenty of awesome exposure this year. Similar to Dromaeosaurus, there isn't any evidence for pack hunting, however, a close relative of Nanuxaurus and Tyrannosaurus, and more closely to Gorgosaurus, Albertosaurus does have some potential evidence, with a group of varying ages having been found in a bone bed. So, them working together is not impossible. Overall, this episode did really well. The models all look great, and there are plenty of feathers. They leaned heavily into pack hunting, but other than that, not many mistakes. Thank you guys all so much for watching this video. If you liked it, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!